one blue, <laughs> uh, for helping me. They voluntarily took on this project and they didn't have to and they are super busy. So thank you guys for being here. And of course, my IDS advisor, Ms. Carrie Sauter. I've been working with her since I transferred in 2012 and she's helped me cultivate my interests and help get this project to where it needs to be today. So, I'm going to begin with a little, a little <coughs> cartoon. Dilbert, for those of you who know. So, Dilbert's on the left with the glasses. He says, our assignment is to make our accounting system less transparent. And his coworker says, what? And Dilbert says, we don't want investors to know what we're doing. And his coworker says, are we bad people? And Dilbert says, we're good people who have been influenced by a corrupt corporate culture. And his coworker says, oh, okay, carry on. So, it's a little fun, it's a kind of a funny way to characterize what white collar crime can look like in the workplace. Uh, the term white collar crime was characterized by uh, Edwin Sutherland in 1939, and there are crimes committed that are nonviolent by people of higher socioeconomic status. So, uh, my interest in white collar crime began with my two internships. My first internship with the French Film Investigative Service, I worked on cases regarding contract fraud and healthcare fraud. And with the Secret Service, I worked on cases, other fraudulent activities such as counterfeiting. One case that stuck with me throughout my time here at UMBC was the Bernard Madoff case. Is anybody familiar? Mm -hmm. So you guys have heard, probably heard of some of the details. So Bernard Madoff was the founder of Madoff Securities, an investment company. And in 2008, he was charged with security frauds, wire frauds, money laundering, and false securities and exchange commission filings. So this is all horrible. <laughs> Uh, so he also cost 50 billion in investment money. So not million, but billion with a B. That's uh, I can't even imagine how much money that is. And ultimately, he was turned in by his own two sons. So there are some good people in the world. And he was charged with 150 years in prison. He was old in 2008, so 150 years is a lot for this man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's, this is an extreme example, but it's just one way uh, white collar crime can uh, really go bad. In order to understand my research question, I want to give everyone a little background. So, United States First Booker was a 2005 Supreme Court case. Um, sorry, it was decided in 2005. And ultimately what it did is make, uh, gave uh, federal sentencing guidelines advisory when they were mandatory before for judges to follow. This increased judicial discretion over sentencing uh, because it just gave them more license over how to sentence since they didn't have to follow the guidelines. Um, so in order to understand that, now you can uh, move on to my research questions, and my primary research question is, do mandatory sentencing guidelines at the federal level have an impact on the way white collar crimes, namely fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering are punished? I looked at this research question through the lens of the United States First Booker and its implications. And I hypothesize that since the guidelines have become advisory, I expected judges to sentence white collar crime more leniently. And my claim was that white collar crime sentencing should be uniform and stricter, and the sentencing guidelines should be reinstated. So, I visualize my topic like this. This is a scaled down version of my concept map, which was some sort of craziness. So, my uh, topic is right here, white collar crime and mandatory sentencing. In the red, you can see the disciplines that I interacted with and how I did that. So whether that was a literature review or a statistical analysis, and in the blue, you can see my two main concepts that I dealt with throughout my research and how they interact with each other and the disciplines at large. I primarily conducted a literature review using sociology and psychology journals. I looked at the American Journal of Criminal Justice and Crime Law and Social Change. And then I conducted statistical analyses using uh, techniques I learned from political science and psychology. Finally, I did a case study search from management journals to understand key, uh, keystone white collar crime cases. In terms of my literature review, I, in corporate culture, I found that investor mistrust is increased if more companies are found acting fraudulently. So this is bad news for the economy, 
because investors are more likely to pull out their money or not invest in the first place. So this could drop in stock, this could create drops in stock prices and all sorts of negative outcomes. In terms of judicial discretion, I found that recent statistics show that there are harsh sentences for violent crimes over white collar crimes, even though I argue both crimes impact communities. So as you can see, I, I gave you a couple examples, and this is still true today. But ultimately, experts that I researched are of both opinions. Some think that sentencing guidelines work well for sentencing white collar crime today, while others believe they create a degree of leniency. For my statistical analysis, I analyzed United States Sentencing Commission data for eight years pre and post Booker, uh, so from 1997 to 2004, and from 2006 to 2013. I looked at what felt like an enormous amount of cases so 75,000 fraud cases, 7,000 embezzlement cases, and 10,000 money laundering cases are included in my 16 fiscal years of analysis. And I conducted two primary analyses. The first, I compared average sentence length pre and post Booker for fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering. And then I compared the percentage of downward departures pre and post Booker from federal guidelines for these same three crimes. So these are operational definitions that I used to define my variables, and these are provided by the United States Sentencing Commission. So they define fraud as deceit, odometer laws and regulations, and insider trading. Embezzlement is defined as illegally taking money from labor unions, property, mail and post office, benefit plans, and banks. And money laundering is our monetary transactions from unlawful activity, failure to file currency reports, and failure to report currency transactions. So Mr. McAlvin told me to make sure I tell everyone it's not laundering clothes, it's laundering money. So let's keep that in mind. <laughs> so here's the first graph characterizing the average sentence length pre and post booker for fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering. The black line you see here characterizes the year booker was decided, 2005. So even if I didn't have that little fancy arrow there, you probably wonder why there's that huge spike. Uh, I've had, I have a theory for this, and it turns out that in Enron, Enron was a company founded in 1985, um, and it was an energy company, and Kenneth Lay was the CEO, and Jeffrey Skilling was the president, were charged with security frauds, wire frauds, and insider trading. They cost uh, upwards of 20,000 employees their jobs, and there was just all sorts of destruction because of their actions. Even though their final conviction didn't happen until 2010, which is much later in my data, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies found out about the scandal in 2002. So my theory is that there's a spike in the data because judges were helping, were kind of covering for these crimes and making sure that there weren't increased, they increased sentences for fraud to ensure this kind of activity didn't become commonplace. Here is the graph characterizing the percentage of downward departures from federal guidelines for the same three crimes. And you can see that money laundering sentences on average are uh, the percentage of, I'm sorry, I said sentences. <laughs> money laundering departures on average are much higher in terms of percentage than fraud and investment. Um, again, the year of Booker is characterized by the black line. And in 2008, for all three crimes, you can see that there's less downward departures from the federal sentencing guidelines and this coincides with the financial meltdown and recession. So this is good news. That means that when the financial meltdown and recession was happening, judges were sentencing within the guidelines and being more strict on people committing mortgage fraud and other things of that nature. Also, since 2005, fraud and investment departures have been increasing while money, money laundering departures have been decreasing. This might be because judges pardon money laundering at higher rates since it's wrapped up with violent crimes more often than fraud and investment. So, this project would not be possible if I didn't include all four of the disciplines that I used. I used all the disciplines, all four disciplines to advance through checks and balances. So I used the work of Miller and Boyks Mancia, and I used different disciplinary perspectives to check each other and keep myself intellectually honest. So this is all good, right? But this is just definition. So what does this look like for my project? 
Um, for my project, I needed this to be uh, to make my project interdisciplinary. So after I conducted my literature review, I was able to use that research to help explain the spikes and drops in my data. Uh, and I, you guys saw a couple examples of that when I just went over my graphs. So I'm going to revisit our, my research questions to see if uh, they were answered. So again, my primary research question was, do mandatory sentencing guidelines have an impact on the way fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering are punished? Well, when I looked at this through the implications of the United States versus Booker, they do have an impact. But, <laughs> in terms of my claim hypothesis, not in the way that I expected. So, again, I hypothesized that if judges had increased discretion, they would use it to be more lenient on white-collar offenders. It turns out my research showed the opposite. So, I'm lucky in that way, right? No. <laughs> Technically, we're all lucky. In a practical sense, this means that judges are taking white-collar crime as seriously as it should be taken. This is good news because hopefully it will decrease incidences and increase deterrence for uh, would-be white-collar offenders. In conclusion, there are two, uh, there's two pieces of added value to what already exists in the environment. This research helps us understand the environment in which judges adhere to and depart from the federal sentencing guidelines. And hopefully it will help decrease variances to yield the highest degree of uniformity in sentencing. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Very interesting. Um, how did you deal with the issue of personal bias in your research? Uh, you mean seeing, expecting to see a certain thing? So that was an issue that I talked to my advisors about. Because I did expect to see that if we had, if judges had more discretion, then of course they're going to let white collar funders go. Like, of course. So what I really tried to do is look at the widest amount of research while still having a narrow focus so that I could make sure to account for all different perspectives. And then I included that in my research. Project, but I'm curious if you encountered anything that um, would inform you and us about the way in which U.S. people are played out in non-white collar crimes. Um, and so I'm curious, like, was there generally uh, like a similar similar sociological um, factor at work in, in both, or is there some differentiation between those two? Um, that is a broad question, you're right. <laughs> yeah. But the, the main thing that I found is that, so not only are there downward departures in terms of Booker uh, and the sentencing guidelines, judges can also upwardly departure. So those happen more often for violent crimes and um, non-white collar crimes. So that's like the main difference that I saw. And since I wasn't able to analyze, I'm not sure what the other specific differences are. Talk a little bit more about like the background of the United States versus Booker case and why you decided to put that at the center of your study of the white collar crime. Yeah, so um, United States. So the main reason the United States versus Booker was kind of like the hallmark of my research was because it provided a good point in which we could compare two things, right? So the best way to make a point is by comparison, and that's how United States versus Booker came into my attention. Um, and it really happened because. When the guidelines existed, people were saying that it was violating uh, offenders, I'm sorry, defendants' Sixth Amendment rights. So that's how this came all the way up to the Supreme Court, and ultimately they changed over in 2005. On the graph where you have, when I got right now, which we go to the investment, it looked to me as if there was an upward trend. Now maybe I'll in what? It looked to me as if there was an upward departure after the book. Um, and maybe I was writing something down while you were explaining that. But I wonder if you could just show me. Uh, oh, obviously not there. Was there another one with embezzlement on, or did I just make a bad note? There. Yes. So the percent. This is the sentence length. Um, it has been. It has been going up since Booker, and that's kind of the trend that I discussed. So I said. I'm so sorry. I was oh no, it's okay. Yeah. So just to clarify, 
Um, I said that I expected to see that judges would be more lenient in, in light of their increased discretion, but it turns out this is not the case for these crimes. I have noticed with both of them. And that's <laughs> no, it's okay. Thank you. Huh? Just to illustrate for everyone, you can ask any question oh. about how dumb I'm on the way. Well, for the sake of time, we're going to move on. But thank you very much. Okay. Have to if you're loud enough. You don't okay. you need the mic. is Capital Punishment in Maryland, and I'd like to give a special thanks to both of my mentors, Dr. Archibald and Dr. Hinkle, one of which actually came from states away to come see me today, <laughs> as well as Jill, who's been an awesome advisor for me, answering so many emails. <laughs> and also a special shout out to Jim Thomas, I know he couldn't be here because he had a class, but he's helped me a lot through this process. So, yes. All right. So I want to start out by saying why capital punishment? Why did that interest me? So first of all, it's a controversial topic, which is always interesting. But just to point out the number on the screen, 152 is the number of individuals who were on death row and were actually found to be innocent. So this is bringing up a big topic of when people are convicted and found to be innocent, um, that brings up the controversial issue based on what why people would support or oppose the death penalty. And an example of this is Kirk Bloodsworth, who was an individual who was put on death row and actually served nine years in jail and eventually was found to be innocent. And he was actually the first person to be exonerated by DNA evidence. Um, and an important part of this is that he was a Maryland resident, which is what my study is focusing on. So I want to start to talk about the history of the death penalty in Maryland, which my study is limited to the modern era. So the modern era started in 1972 with Thurman v. Georgia, which is a Supreme Court decision that decided that the arbitrary and inconsistent manner in which the death penalty was applied is a violation of the Eighth Amendment, which is on cruel and unusual punishment. So this placed a moratorium on the use of the death penalty throughout all the states. And this was lifted in 1976 with the Supreme Court decision of Gregg v. Georgia. And in Gregg versus Georgia, they decided that the death penalty doesn't always violate the Eighth Amendment as long as it follows the guidelines that are set out in that decision. So in 1994, lethal injection was started to use as the method of execution in Maryland, which is when the first individual was executed in Maryland, which you can see by the dots. The five dots are the five people that were executed in Maryland during the modern era only. So there were two more that happened after that before um, Governor Glenn Dunning put a moratorium on the death penalty, which was then lifted two years later by Governor Ehrlich, which resulted in two more executions, which followed by, the, in 2009, O'Malley's bill for stricter guidelines, which actually ended up being the strictest state that had guidelines for the death penalty. And then in 2013, Governor O'Malley signed a bill repealing the death penalty in Maryland, which made Maryland the 18th state to abolish the death penalty. Um, this left five inmates on death row, but he commuted their sentence from, um, from the death sentence to life without parole. So my research question is what led to the death penalty repeal in Maryland? My first hypothesis is that social inequality and application of the death penalty is what raised awareness and changed public's opinion. The second hypothesis is that 
political affiliation based on the fact that Maryland's a democratic state with a democratic governor at the time is what led to the repeal. So I want to lead you through my disciplines and start with philosophy. 